Good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. We're getting a little bit closer to the end of our church year, and before you know it, we'll be here in Advent and start it all over again. But today our message is about Jesus again, but more specifically about the great salvation that we have in Jesus. So before we get started this morning, there's just a couple announcements. The first one for Central Food Ministry. Karen, if you'd come up and share that. Thank you, Karen. Just another set of announcements. They're both related. Um, First one dealing with next Sunday. So next Sunday will be LWML Sunday, Lutheran Women in Mission. The the service and the themes are about that mission. LWML will sponsoring the coffee hour next Sunday for that. Now, prior to Sunday, they are also having a meeting on Saturday here at the church at 10 a.m., So women are welcome to join them in their regularly scheduled meeting. Now with that, please everyone stand as we begin our worship today, this 20th Sunday after Pentecost. And we do begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We sing our opening song, Everlasting God. Thank you.
Lord, as we stand in your presence, we are aware of our sins of thought, word, and action. We have often failed to live up to your expectations. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But we know your promise that if we confess our sins, O oh Lord, hear us now as we confess our sins to you. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. We also sing our song of confession, Healing Grace. Of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, 
and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We now read Psalm 128 responsively. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Let us pray. Merciful Father, your patience and loving kindness toward us have no end. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may always think and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The Old Testament reading for today comes to us from Genesis, the second chapter. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. Be to Our epistle lesson comes to us from the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one origin. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. 
And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand now for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Pharisees came up and in order to test Jesus asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What their God, therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated now as we sing our song of the day, In Christ Alone.
his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stood. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and from his Son in truth and love. So almost a month now, we were here together in worship celebrating Rally Day. Rally Day is the beginning of our education year. And we talked through a new theme for this year and some theme verses reflecting endurance in Christ. And I just want to share those verses with us again this morning. It was Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So with that in mind, last week as we were here, the message that Pastor Brazina shared with us, as we are running with endurance that race that God has set before us, we were encouraged to pray. We were encouraged to pray because prayer is powerful. Prayer is effective. We were encouraged not to neglect prayer, but when we do fail to live up to that biblical charge to pray without ceasing, to seek and rest insured in Christ's forgiveness, one for us on the cross. So together today as a family in Christ, with the Holy Spirit alive and active in our lives, not only last week but this week, we encourage each other to pray and pray for each other. And if we look at our lessons for today, it, it continues that thought of family and God's design for family. We see God's design for marriage and the family for children and also what happened to that design when sin entered the world where we don't see that plan so clearly anymore. But sin and our human nature goes afoul of that. But as we look at our lessons, we still see God's love for us, his children. We see that salvation, that great salvation won for us in Jesus, where Jesus calls us his brothers. He calls us his sisters. And today in our epistle lesson, we hear at the very start a caution, but also a charge to the family of believers to pay closer attention to what we've heard and not neglect such a great salvation in Christ, our brother and our Lord. So let's listen again to those first few verses of our epistle lesson, Hebrews 2, starting with verse 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have learned, lest we drift away from it. 
For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Just like on rally day, our lesson started with the word therefore, and it's appropriate that it starts with therefore again today because it lets us know there was something that came before our lesson something we should probably read or pay attention to. And in point of fact, it is in Hebrews chapter 1. So let me just read a few verses of that. I'll go through the first three verses as we go through this next little bit. But it starts this way. Long ago, at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. So in that first chapter, it starts off in those first two verses, Jesus is distinguished very clearly from the prophets as the culmination of their life and their message from God that they proclaimed. So this week, as we hear that word, therefore, it includes Jesus. It includes Jesus being Savior and God. He, in verse 3, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So by the order of creation and the order of redemption that we hear about there, Jesus is in all things God, speaking among us in these last days. And if we continue in chapter 1, we hear of another class of created beings that isn't us not us humans, but rather the angels. Angels are praising God in heaven. They're his servants as he pleases, but they're not human beings. Angels, after all, are angels. Now our Savior, as we read, once made lower than the angels, is crowned with glory and honor. As the psalmist said, or as we hear, he is at the right hand of the majesty on high. So all of this that we've just talked about is contained in that first word of our text, that first word, therefore, that unbroken message of the prophets of God and God's call to God's Christ, Jesus. Then the glory of the angels bows to the majestic glory of a Savior, Jesus. So as we continue to read, it's the greatness of this salvation, which is at the heart of our text today, our lesson today. In fact, it's at the heart of the entire second chapters of Hebrews. And so we've heard in verse 3 where it says, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So it's on these words that all the other words of our text depend today, as do our eternal souls. So this salvation given by Jesus that we hear about, Jesus, the founder of our salvation, our Savior, is our greatest treasure, but is also neglected to our greatest peril. So if we think about that word neglect in our message today, in the verses that we see there, verse 3, the picture and meaning of that is contained in the warning that said, pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. It reminds us that if we remain simply passive observers and not active hearers, how quickly and kind of insidiously we drift away from that message of salvation in Jesus. And as the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh work against us, little by little, our attention wanders from God and his Christ. And little by little becomes a lot. So let's think about that neglect. There are many times where we might think neglect in some forms seems to help us live out our lives. And let me explain that a little bit. If we look at our lives today, if we look in our world today, what's going on around us, it's an awfully busy place and usually not in a good way. We look at all the instabilities internationally, the wars and troubles going on. We see all the political machinations going on this year with an election coming up 
and the incessant political commercials that go along with that too. Recently, we've seen some very great effects, destructive effects of weather. You can also think of disease, places where crime seems to be out of control too. So there's a lot of stuff going on in our daily lives, and if you pay attention to the news, that's all you hear about. It really just creates a sense of daily, never-ending crisis. And if you ignore all that for a while, just kind of put that to the side, we still have families, the people around us. So even if those other things didn't exist, there's still all the things going on with our families, how we should be there cultivating love, caring for each other, recognizing our responsibilities, the roles that God has given us to fulfill, learning to love sacrificially for one another, and practicing repentance and forgiveness for one another where we do fail in that regard. If we think about that, that would be a full-time pursuit as well. So in reaction to all of this, you think about what's going on in the world, you think about what's going on in your family, perhaps at work as well. We find that sometimes we do neglect some things in this life, not always because we should, but sometimes just to take the pressure off telling ourselves we really do need a break so that we don't stay so completely and totally overwhelmed. So it's pretty easy, pretty easy to see if we think about it that neglect is a reality in our lives, but it's not a sustainable solution. Think also of this, the magnitude of that neglect is determined by the importance of a thing that we may choose to neglect. Maybe a simple thing like ignoring a snide remark or kind of an offhand comment that's not so positive. Maybe that's wise neglect. But neglecting your body could be lethal, could be deadly. Neglecting your home, neglecting your family could damage more than just you and maybe be hard to repair. But if we think about Scripture, Scripture surmounts all of this when God asks us to consider in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? So notice that word escape as well. May have passed over that, but if we cut right to the point that escape, what we're talking about is escaping retribution or judgment, God's judgment. And it's a significant part of understanding that great salvation that we may be neglecting. So verse 2 of our text, I'll read it again. It says, For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. So thinking of that as law, just retribution, tells us we are fair and square, destined for punishment. That's what we deserve. That's what our sins and our sinfulness requires because justice is involved and we've been passive or even active sinners. And because God is good, God is just. He punishes that sin. He doesn't play favorites and he pulls no punches. But thankfully for us, God's justice is good. He's not capricious. He's dependable in his punishment, so we always know exactly where we stand, that what is right, what is wrong, does not change as the truth changes through the ages, but is always the same. We also know that unless there is some purification, some salvation, some escape from that, we own that retribution. That is our price to pay, and it'll be coming at the last day. But we also know that Jesus took care of our salvation. So we find many examples in Scripture that show us God's message declared by angels, which remind us of that salvation. So after Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the garden. There were cherubim placed on the eastern side of Eden that forced them out, forced them also not to look back to what could have been, but to look forward to that promise of the Savior that God had given them, that there would be a Savior, one born of the woman, who would crush the devil. 
We think about the angels who met Abraham in Genesis, telling him and his wife Sarah about the promise to come that they would have a son. That same promise that was given to their descendants, that same promise that was fulfilled as the angels declared to Mary, Joseph, and the shepherds that Jesus would be born, would be born in this world. That announcement, too, that would also hail his crucifixion, his resurrection, and declaring that message to all who sought the living among the dead, that Christ was not there. And since there is escape in Jesus from receiving that just retribution, that punishment we owe, then for sure we do have a great salvation to celebrate, and we should celebrate it. So as we look at the word neglect, and we saw how it was tied to the importance, perhaps, of what was neglected, let's look at salvation. We find that salvation is also tied to the magnitude of what we escape, that retribution that we truly owe that Jesus paid. We find the greatness of salvation is tied to that from which we have escaped in Jesus. So what makes this salvation such a great salvation? It's a God who loves you. It's a God who gave his only son, whose blood paid the price for your sins committed, whose blood cleanses you from all the guilt of that sin, whose blood sets you free to be people of God. Salvation's greatness doesn't lie in you or me. It lies in God. It lies in Jesus and what he has done for us. The greatness of salvation is that God took note of your sorry situation, your helpless attempts at holiness, your careless Christianity, and God simply loved you. He saw that doubt, that fear, that worry in your life and pitied you as a father. The greatness of salvation is God in majesty loving you in misery and becoming your great salvation. With one person, Jesus, and him crucified, he made your salvation a reality. If we continue with our text, it tells us a few more things that I think are worth mentioning. Verse 3, such a great salvation was declared at first by the Lord. So we think back to the Old Testament, as we said before, God, great in grace, in patience, in mercy, promised Adam and Eve a savior who would crush the serpent's head. In the New Testament, we see that fulfilled. God himself traveled from heaven to be here on earth with us, to be that very declaration in our midst of God's saving purpose. More in verse 3, such a great salvation was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. If we think about those Old Testament witnesses, think about Adam and his family, Noah. Think about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, the men who went up on the mountain, the stream of prophets that God sent, declared and attested to that. And in the New Testament, we see the disciples, the 70 that God sent out, the multitudes that heard God in Jesus standing daily in the temple courts, preaching on the mountains. And each generation has told their loved ones, their children. In verse 4, our salvation says, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles. We think to a few of those in the Old Testament. Think about Moses calling from the burning bush, calling to lead God's people. The miracles of parting the Red Sea, feeding and caring for his people with manna, with quail, with water from the rock, and ultimately bringing them to that promised land of Canaan. We see it also fulfilled in the New Testament in Jesus. Each miracle that he does shows him to be that bread of life, that he has that living water the healing, the giving of life. He's Lord over nature. In verse 4, our salvation continues where it says, God also bore witness by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. 
So in the birth of this church, centered on Christ, all the power, all the gifts of the Godhead are given and distributed to us, his people, by the Holy Spirit. They're for every age, they're for every situation as God determines and distributes them to us. And verse 5, our salvation is greater than any angel's works. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, but God made it his personal business. Jesus is the founder of all of this, as it says in our lesson. He didn't leave it to his ministering angels to do it. He took it upon himself personally to come here. And we're partakers of what he accomplished here. Through his perfect life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, he bestowed that great salvation on us. If we think about it astonishingly, God in Jesus has tasted death for all of us. And that is where our great salvation comes from. And because this salvation is so great, how could we neglect it? If we think about it, that salvation is greater than any sin or sinfulness that we have. It's greater than anything we face this day or God willing tomorrow and the day after and the day after. It's greater than anything the devil can throw at us, accuse us of, could possibly lay against us at that last day when Jesus comes again. And it assures us that our names are written in the book of life. So as we close today, I offer a parting thought. God has built great joy into his great salvation. So if you ever find yourself guilty of neglecting it, the process of confessing that to God, receiving that forgiveness from Jesus centers you back in that restoring work that Jesus did on the cross. It centers you back in the care of the crucified Jesus. It brings back to you the appreciation, back to you the greatness of your salvation in Jesus because it brings you back to your Savior in his loving arms. It reorients you away from your neglect to God's joyous embrace. That great salvation and so great a Savior who loves us sends you back to him, the one who calls us brothers, the one who calls us sisters, because he loves us. Such is your greatest treasure. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand now for prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Loving Father, your Son took the little children into his arms and blessed them. Help your saints to welcome little ones with joy, that nothing may hinder their entrance into the kingdom of God and the arms of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you give us men to guide your church on earth. We ask your blessing for our synod president, our district president, our circuit visitor, and all pastors, together with the many servants and treasurers of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, you led your holy apostles to ordain ministers for the proclamation of your word and the faithful administration of the sacraments of Christ. Grant to this congregation the guidance of the Holy Spirit to choose a suitable pastor according to your will for the blessing of your church in this place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, be near all couples struggling in their marriages. Guard them from hardness of heart that would separate what you have joined together and reconcile them to one another to live in Christ's forgiveness and love. Be near to families torn apart by adultery and divorce. Sustain and heal the wounded with your love. Give repentance to the guilty and hope in your forgiveness in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, grant your wisdom to our president, to all public servants, 
to all in our armed forces and to those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, that they may be strengthened and upheld in every good deed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, you promise to abide with your people and uphold them in their suffering. Comfort all who are sick and sorrowing, especially Lynn, Joyce, Michael, Dan, Carolyn, Bud, Henry, Richard, Barbara, John, Bill, Annetta, Carol, Laureen, Beth, and Jimmy. Strengthen their faith in the midst of their trials and grant them health and healing according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, help us by your spirit to fear you and walk in your ways in Christ, that we may eat the fruit of the labor of our hands and receive your blessing in all that we do. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the same Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord look upon us with favor and give us peace. Amen. We now sing our closing song, Praise the King.
Okay. 